Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Nicholas Mark from SLP International. Uh, very pleased to be here today and to see that uh, SP Property managed to fill up the entire hall. I think this is... Uh, let's give them a round of applause for their organisations and enthusiasm to, in, um, to basically spread education and knowledge uh, in the Singapore real estate market. Now, today my topic is about the master plan and its impact on the real estate market. I'll be touching on um, a few topics here, um, chiefly what is the master plan. Um, I'll go into a bit more details about that. And then I'll touch on certain uh, locations and use them as examples of how the master plan affects uh, the real estate market in those areas, such as Jurong, Woodlands, Holland V, Kampong Bugis, and Bidadari. Now, the Singapore Master Plan, if you were to go to, uh, it's accessible from the URA website. If you go, this is basically what it looks like. A mishmash of colours uh, that basically uh, makes it a bit of a nightmare for people who are colourblind. They, and in fact, some of the colours are very close, very close together, huh? like for example, for hotels and for certain uh, industrial. They, they, you have to, it's just a different shades of that uh, different colours. But the master plan itself is actually multi-layered, right? Like for example, this one actually shows where are the locations of the landed properties. So you can actually strip them away into landed, non-landed, HDB, commercial, industrials, and so on. They also uh, indicate, sometimes in broad strokes, this is a bit easier to uh, some understand, where are some of the commercial and industrial parts of Singapore? Now, very often we think of uh, a lot of our industrial properties are located in the West, uh, but in truth is that they are scattered all over Singapore. It's just that perhaps somewhere in the West, you get more of the B2 zoning, while in other parts, uh, like for example in the East and Central, you get more of the B1, light and clean type of zoning. The master plans also gives um, in details um, what some of the regional centres uh, could be developed into. And in Singapore, we have about four to five uh, regional centres. Huh? Uh, chiefly, they are at Tampines, Jurong East, Woodlands. Selita uh, is a, a bit of a new one. And originally, it was Paleba, but I think Paleba is now more of a a smaller regional centres. Huh? So, the master plan, basically it is an urban planning tool uh, used by the government uh, to basic, because Singapore, we know that we are land scarce, so land being a very valuable resources will need to be allocated to all the different competing needs uh, to achieve its uh, maximum efficiency. So, it indicates the zoning, which is the allowable users, the plot ratio, which is the development intensity, or how um, in the old days, decades ago, it was uh, population per hectare. That was another way of uh, measuring its uh, plot ratio. And the height restrictions, right, which is normally could be measured either in terms of number of floors or in terms of the number of meters above the mean sea level. It shows the possible future development in practically every location in Singapore, uh, but in some areas, the government still keep it in reserve, so you may see a yellow colour, which means that it is reserved for future planning. It is part of the population planning policies. Like, for example, when uh, not too long ago, the government came up with a white paper about, the population white paper about, um, I think it's that notorious number of 6.9 million people in the future. I think a lot of uh, attention was focused on how are we going to accommodate 6.9 million uh, people. But it was more of just a, a broad stroke, actually, that number. So the master plan uh, basically implements, um, it's trying to put in place how this population planning policy is going to be uh, implemented. It is used by a lot of people in the private sector, such as planners, architects, developers, real estate uh, professionals like yourself, uh, property owners and buyers. Increasingly, even your layman, property uh, owners, are getting more educated and they know how to find the master plan, to find out even before they buy a property, 
they will check the master plan to see what are some of the new developments that is coming up near their target property and whether or not um, it is a plus or minus point or whether does it meet their future uh, expectations. Currently, um, or rather in the last 20 years or so, this master plan has been amended every five years. And current, our current master plan, uh, which is still the 2008 master plan, there's a new one. The 2013 master plan is still in the draft stage and is expected to be gazetted by the parliament, hopefully, in this round of sitting. So it's the impact of the master plan on the real estate market, it can impact on demand. Now, this is on the assumption that the Singapore population keep on expanding. And I think it's a fair assumption. I, I don't think we are reaching a stage like Japan, where actually the population is shrinking. Or in some other countries like Somalia, where you've got civil wars and, and basically a state of anarchy, and the population, if they can get out, they will get out of the country. So the, the impact is that if the population, if the um, economy is still in, on the very positive note, if people have confidence in the future of the country, um, it will have positive impact on demand. The master plan, um, typically the plot ratio will increase. Only on a few rare occasions sometimes, the plot ratio actually is lower than that of the existing building. So you can expect the new master plan to lead to an increase in the supply of uh, property in certain areas. And typically, it could have a positive impact on prices. But I must um, put one thing in note. I know that there are many property agents in, in this room. Um, I don't want to give the impression that, oh, because the master plan is coming out, it will definitely be a uh, positive impact on prices, and then you go and tell the buyers, or oh, because Nicholas Mark said this about the master plan, so you must buy this property. Um, one thing about um, agents, uh, it's not just one agent or agents in general, is that sometimes you may have to tailor, adjust what you say when you meet a buyer, and then what you say to a seller is, could be something slightly different. Huh? Uh, to quote another agent who have um, said something that I overheard, he says, 见人讲人话, 见鬼讲鬼话. Although I don't know whether her client is a human or a demon huh? in this case. So basically, I'm just going to um, share with you what I found out and how you're going to tailor make for your client. I leave that entirely to you. Another impact is on rents. Now, how, it, how the master plans affect prices or rents or property value in short, it's basically it's um, future planning, future infrastructure, be it MLT stations, roads, schools, hospitals, or places of employment in a certain area. And of course, one thing that very often when the master plan comes out, people want to know whether is there a chance for a collective sale or on-block sale. Now, for the last three master plans, there has been no, uh, including this one coming up, there has been no increase in plot ratio in many of the residential developments. In other words, um, some owners who are actually maybe in a property that's 20-odd years old and hoping that there could be an on-block sale uh, they may find that their plot ratio has not increased. Um, I think in the 2013 one, it's, unless there is a significant change huh, from the draft master plan, that will still remain the case. Now, our first example is about the Jurong Lake District. Now, the Jurong Lake District, um, the first must, actually the first regional centres to have come uh, that is successfully completed in a way is Tampanese, and Jurong is the second one. We see that in the Jurong, in most of the regional centres, the area that is around the MLT stations are some of the most valuable, and hence it will be the most um, densely developed area, and very often they tend to be commercial. And in the, let me see, in the Jurong East um, area, we see that the area that is around the Jurong uh, East MLT stations, they tend to be commercial or mixed development. 
there is one part here in the past it was you see a lot part of it is actually zone yellow which is for future planning and in the 2008 one here you get one residential uh, development here while the rest is going to be largely commercial but one thing um, that is unique about the uh, Jurong master plan is that it was implemented very quickly or, or the development happens one after um, one development after another happened very rapidly within a fairly short span of time the government also uh, indicate a great uh, level of support for it like for example indicating certain government organizations will be moved to the Jurong Lakeside area uh, some uh, GLCs have indicated that they will be moving there as well and in this area eventually it will be developed into not just an area with commercial development uh, but also with hotels education institutions a new science center and other facilities now this is an artist's impression of what the Jurong Lake site district uh, will look like when it is developed. In fact, I expect it to be even more densely populated, so we may see a bit less green area. And nearer to the MLT stations, you will actually see a cluster of different types of um, commercial development, especially some new shopping centres that is currently been in operations. And near the Lake Districts, we can see some low-rise uh, development, both a mixture of commercial as well as some residential development that actually will enjoy waterfront um, views. So, actually in the last three years or so, the government has been very active in bringing, trying to raise the population in the Western District. Like, for example, in year 2000, the Jurong West planning area only had a population about 204,000 people. 204,000 people. And in, five, in about 10 years' time, the population actually increased by about 32% to about 271,000 people. So, making the Jurong East area actually the second most populated planning area in Singapore second only to Bedok. And to put things in context, Bedok was already the most populated area uh, back then with about 284. So the rate of population growth in Bedok wasn't as fast, but Jurong uh, populations actually increased quite tremendously. And here's the thing. The master plan actually is just a plan. Without the physical um, structure, without the people in that area, Actually, it, by itself, it will not do anything to property value. So you actually need to have people and building and plans to, put, um, to let it have an impact on the property market. So these are some of the commercial uh, developments that have come out uh, in this area. And in more details, GEMS and Westgate, these are the uh, newer developments uh, that have been completed in this uh, Jurong district area. And an analysis of the impact on the price trend in this area. Uh, what we did was that we look at, we create a, a Western district price index and to see how uh, this master plan or other events within the master plan that affects this price index. We find that Without, even though the master plan is in place, without any new launches, that means without um, any new developments happening there, the prices actually follow very much um, the island-wide mass market property prices. It's when the Caspian is launched, okay, in uh, 2009, we actually have, 2008-2009, uh, we have the financial crisis, prices drop, but as when the Caspian was launched, it actually helped to buoyant up the property prices in the Western area. And then later on, when, time, uh, when the good times returned in 2011, when the Lakeside residence was launched, this actually caused a sharper increase, increase in both the transaction volume as well as prices. And then after that, basically, the prices of, uh, in the Jurong, West, uh, Jurong East area actually, well, 
has been outperforming the island-wide mass market price index until J Gateway. I think J Gateway basically um, broke all the records in that area in terms of dollar per square feet as well as causing the prices, uh, the price index to spike uh, very highly. And then after that, with all the cooling measures, the TDSR and so on, um, the prices in that area began to cool. Another example um, that I'm going to bring is about woodlands. Now, earlier I mentioned there were a few uh, master plan, uh, sorry, a few regional centers. Tampines, basically that is a done deal. It is uh, quite fully developed. Jurong East, it is, um, you can see that within the span of about five years, it has been, uh, it has developed quite rapidly. I think the next area that actually shows quite a bit of promises and where the government is going to focus its development attention is actually woodlands. So, woodlands actually would be part of the Northern Corridor, which will stretch from uh, Woodlands Regional Centres all the way to Salita, uh, which is where we see our new um, the Aerospace Centre is going to be uh, located. And it will even touch partly uh, part of Pongo. Eh? And I think with the expressway, uh, and uh, you will also, in a way, uh, it will increase the accessibility and possibly demand. So in the Woodlands Regional Centres, most of the area north of the Woodlands MRT station is still zoned yellow, which means that it is meant for, for future planning. But in the north, there is a north-south axis North-South axis, you can see the southern part is already zoned for commercial use. But this northern part, this is going to be mostly commercial or mixed development. And on the east and western side of it is going to be zoned for residential. So in this area, um, most of the development is going to be centred around the MRT stations. But I don't think that its speed is going, development speed is going to be as fast as that for the Jurong East area. Uh, one of the reasons is because, well, I think so far the government hasn't announced which ministry or state boards or so on is going to move to the Woodlands area. Um, also, the other one is depends on the timing of some of these um, development plans. Like, for example, it's quite fortunate that in the uh, Jurong area, a lot of the developments actually coincide with the previous property boom. Okay, that lasted from 2009 to somewhere in the middle of last year, where prices was growing quite steadily and demand was very strong. This time around, uh, for the woodlands area, well, I think we are already, well, needless to say, we are somewhere at the start of a cooling down period, so the development will also be a bit slower. But it doesn't mean that you see, the master plan will still be in place regardless of whether the market goes up or down. It all depends on whether or not uh, you have faith that eventually it will, be met, uh, it will materialize. And I believe it will. So there's one more thing interesting about the woodlands area is that outside this area, this circle area, there are mostly HDB flats here, 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 and here. So basically, the people who are already the existing owners are mostly HDB flat owners. So if you are private property owners, there's not really a lot of private property around this area. Right? The other one is the Musling Industrial Estate area. Right? Um, that area will probably also see an increase uh, in activities as well as demand once the development of the Woodlands um, Regional Centre is put in place there could be possibility of redevelopment or some sort of um, sale of properties for redevelopment purposes in these industrial estates. A bit further north of the woodlands in our regional centres is the area, there will be a few MLT stations as, because there's a new MLT line that is going to be in place. And they are going to be located near the existing uh, Republic Polytechnic, this will be part of the Thompson line. And as new MLT stations uh, comes into operation, I think it will 
definitely have a positive impact on property prices and demand in that particular location. And in time to come, the government will also be selling more land uh, to be developed into um, condominiums as well as commercial developments in this area. There will also be a business park, a new business park in this area. You know that in the Tampanese area, there's a, there's a business park there, and in, uh, and in the Jurong East area, there's also a business park. So in the Woodlands area, there will be a business park as well, towards the northern area here. And that uh, business park will eventually draw be a place where employment is created, and that will also increase demand for housing in those areas. But one thing about um, a lot of this uh, master plan, uh, if the master plan is in a certain new town, in a certain non-matured estate, a lot of the land are still owned by the state. So in other words, the new development will come about only when you have government land sale. So very often, um, the ultimate winner is actually the government because when, as the property value increases in a certain area and they sell the land, they will also be able to uh, capitalize on the increase in capital values. So these are some of the aerial pictures of the Woodlands uh, Regional Centres. And this is the Thompson Line, the new Thompson Line that uh, I mentioned earlier that will be linking all the way from uh, the northern part of Singapore uh, down to the south. We might, it might even be near the future uh, terminal that will be linking Singapore and Johor. Now, its impact, the, the impact of the master plan or the new development within the Woodlands area on the private property prices is that we only start seeing, uh, one of the reasons is that there is not really a lot of transactions. There's not really a lot of private properties um, in the northern area uh, that is near to the Woodlands Regional Centres. So we actually see very often the north region price uh, index that were created tend to track the nationwide mass market property price index all the way until two developments have been launched. One is Woods Haven, the other one is Park Rosewood, where they basically, um, the launch of these two developments both increase the transaction volume as well as the price index in the area. But once after these two developments have been launched, so, and because at the, by that time the government has implemented the seller stamp duty, um, there wasn't a lot of subsale and flipping, so we see that uh, the price returned back to follow the island-wide price index. Another one is uh, Holland V. Now, the two earlier master plans that I mentioned are basically major uh, master plans for a very big locations, for areas that are going to be formed part of a regional centres. Holland V is going to be a bit different because it is a, a more matured housing estate. It is more built up. There are already existing uh, properties in that area, and there are not really a lot of vacant land. So most of the developments is going to be uh, centred west of the Holland Village MRT station, around this area. Some of them are HDB estates or HDB flats, and some of them are green area. In time to come, this area is going to become private housing as well as a mixed development a mixed uh, commercial and residential development in this area. There, some of the areas around here are actually private housing, so the government wouldn't be doing compulsory land acquisition um, to take it over and redevelop it. So in a certain area, which is like Holland V, where it is already fairly built up, you can expect it's more of an urban renewal rather than an entire uh, greenfield type of development. So the plan is actually to increase the accessibility right, to different parts of Holland V within this new... In, in a way, you can say it's like an expansion of that uh, Holland Village town centre. As a new development comes out and there will be new shopping centres um, in that new area, the roads will, uh, could be expanded where possible 
and then it's, it's basically to increase the accessibility for all the residents, including those in private housing estates, um, towards this new town centre. Another one, this is uh, Bidadari is a bit unique because, well, uh, for those of you who remember, it is it was a former um, cemetery. So in a way, it is a greenfield kind of development because the, the, the grace has been exhumed. So it is one big vacant site. But it is within a matured housing estate. This area is the Bidadari estate, the one that is in a red dotted line. It is mounted by Bartley Road, so, Serangoon Road, and on this side, it is the Macpherson Road. So the Bidadari area, actually, it doesn't, it's going to be a new housing estate that doesn't have an MRT station at its heart. Instead, you have three MRT stations on this site. Um, Bartley MRT stations to the north, the Potong Pase and Woodlash MRT station to the west. This is... This area is likely to be mostly residential. I think uh, it's going to be a mixture of both HDB as well as private uh, residential in this area. We could see more uh, some neighborhood kind of uh, commercial development coming up in this area. And some of the other more commercial, your typical shopping centers type of uh, development may be planned nearer to the existing MRT station. Already, there is one site that is located near the uh, Potong Pasi MRT stations that is offered for sale, that is zoned for commercial and residential development, and the tenders is going to close sometime this year. So that is one example of um, how the government is planning for an increase in population in this area by providing the land for future commercial development. So, in conclusion, the master plan by itself does not increase property value without the physical development materialising within that um, planned area. The new infrastructure, like MRT stations, roads and so on, they form a catalyst for the growth in demand and property value. And the government would at, while coming up with the master plan, we'll need to actually balance between several um, competing users, such as for economic users, for a growing and aging population, where they have to uh, decide whether or not to, like for example, a piece of land, should they build a school for a younger population or should they build a hospital for the aging population? Uh, they will also be, need to build new infrastructure to cater to the growth in population in the area, uh, roads, MRT, but at the same time, they may also need to build new seaports or even expanding our existing airports. And last but not least, there is also the need for defence. Um, Singapore's a bit different from cities like Sydney, Melbourne or Hong Kong where they do not need um, to have army or armed forces infrastructure very close to the urban centre. Singapore's unique, we need to have that because we are a small island state. Now, I'll just conclude off. There will be many questions, especially when the market is in transitions. Like, for example, is this the right time to buy? Or what type of property should I buy? Or should I sell some of my um, existing properties? And which type of properties not to hold? Now, if you have any such questions or your clients may have such questions, feel free to call my department. Uh, that's my number. Uh, we do consulting and research for a very reasonable fee, right? And I think for today only, the first 10 clients to call up will be giving a 30% discount. <laughs> well, that's the sales part. Right, with that, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention.